Good afternoon. It is the 16th of August, 3.30 p.m., and I'm recording your introduction and your Chapter 15 lecture video all at once. I want to welcome you to History 1112, World History 2, since 1500. Uh, this is an online-only class, and uh, most of our work is going to go Tuesday to Monday, so I am recording this a day early and then making it available for you on Tuesday the 17th. Um, today, um, I want to just go over chapter 15. We're going to talk about a couple different empires in the Americas. And I want to go over the syllabus with you as well. Uh, the syllabus is available in Blackboard, so I do hope that you get a second to look at this. <clears throat> uh, my name is Mr. Kennedy, and my email address is jason.kennedy at westgatech.edu. Uh, you can always reach me through email uh, when I'm not teaching classes. Uh, I do teach a uh, class in Carrollton, I teach two classes in Douglasville, and I teach a class in Noonan as well. And my office is on the Carroll campus. So I have my office information here and my office hours as well. If you find yourself in Carrollton, you are welcome to stop by my office and I would love to meet you. There is a textbook. Uh, it's called Patterns of World History, Volume 2 from 1400. That's available at the West Georgia Technical College Bookstore. Uh, there is an electronic version available if you're somebody that likes ebooks. It is a little bit cheaper. Uh, you can always buy that as well. That's okay. I'm going to scroll down here. Uh, a couple of things I want you to know that I want to make sure that I touch on. Course attendance. There is an attendance grade in this class, even though it's online. Uh, pretty much you have to complete at least one assignment per week just to be considered present. It's pretty easy to do, so just make sure you do your work each week. That's all I can say. Uh, for plagiarism, uh, you have to make sure that all the work in this class is your own. You can't cheat, no stealing, no lying, nothing like that. So please, please, please make sure that all your work is yours. I can promise you and guarantee you that any work you do on your own that is confirmed yours, you'll automatically score higher than if I find out that you've gotten your information from the internet. Um, so once again, please make sure that you adhere to the academic policies and please make sure that all the work in this class is yours. As far as grading goes, uh, there are two tests. There's a midterm exam and a final exam. Uh, I do have four reflection papers, which are opinion-based papers. You will have to go to a museum for this class. And then there are discussion boards, there are some quizzes, and there's an essay you're required to do as well. Now for the exam, uh, they're not cumulative. So the midterm is the first half of the class and the final is the second half of the class. For the reflection papers, they're opinion-based. There are going to be primary source readings within the Blackboard folders, the lesson folders, and you will have to write about those. And I give you some information here. It says, please use your first paragraph to quickly summarize the article you've chosen to reflect on. And they should be one and a half to two pages long. Make sure they're double spaced and um, make sure that they are your opinion. For the museum exhibit review, you're expected to go to one of the museums on this list here and then write a two and a half to three page double spaced review of it. Uh, you can tell me whether you like it or don't like it. And then also I would need you to, to uh, think kind of like a historian. Um, and I give you a couple of example questions there, like does the museum make sense? Are the exhibits explain things like that here's your list of museums and each one of these is a clickable link on the syllabus and i make it a clickable link so that way you can decide if it's a museum you're interested or not and some of them are are close to Carrollton, some of them are close to douglasville some of them are metro atlanta some of them are further away uh, there should hopefully be a museum here for everybody I also have listed the prices. Some of them are free, some of them are expensive. Uh, just kind of take a look and see what you can see. The 
museum review can be turned in any time during the semester. I think it's the 30th it's due or the or somewhere around in there, the 30th of November. It's the end of November when it's got to be turned in by, but you can turn it in any time during the semester. For activities, that's going to be your discussion questions. Well, since it's online, we won't have in-class discussion. Uh, the activities is going to be your quizzes and your participation. The discussion boards will be a separate category, so you have to complete your discussion questions each week. And then the SLOSA, this is something that everybody taking history at West Georgia Tech has to do. It's a research essay for World History II. It's explain the causes of World War I, and I'll make sure that I do a special video just on that later in the semester. Last but not least, uh, you can see extra credit. Uh, you if you visit a second museum and write a second museum review, then you can get two points on your final grade. And then at the end is the course schedule. This is what we're doing each week. This is week one, so I'm going to be covering chapter 15. All the work for chapter 15 is due next Monday, which would be the 23rd by 11.59 p.m. And I have it listed, student introduction, discussion, discussion one, and a chapter 15 quiz. And it's like that all through the semester. Any of the bigger assignments, like the reflection papers or the museum review, I have tried to put in bold so that they stand out a little bit. Now, I don't want to bore you with this because the lecture is going to probably be boring enough, I'm sure. So uh, if you have any questions about anything in Blackboard, anything that doesn't make sense on this syllabus, send me an email. I will be more than happy to answer those emails for you and help you out in any way I can. But let's go back to this chapter 15. It's really short. There are just a couple of groups of people I want to tell you about. Uh, the first group I want to tell you about is they're called the Toltecs. They're generally seen as the oldest of the New World civilizations. And the Toltecs, uh, roughly early 200s to the late 500s is when they existed. And they were popular. They were um, powerful for a little bit. Um, they're not the first group of people to live in the New World, but they're the first organized group of people to live in Central America. And they got started in a city named Tula. Uh, Tula is in like Central Mexico, kind of close to the coast. And that's where the Toltecs started and they expanded out from there and they conquered the people around them. And by the 900s or so, uh, the Toltecs are going to be the primary group of people. They are the most powerful group of people. And they have started their little conquest with just a small group of people. And then suddenly they're huge. Some of the things that help the Toltecs become so powerful uh, they have a sort uh, sword that you can see a picture of here. It's made of wood and obsidian. Obsidian is a very, very strong type of glass. It's a volcanic glass, and it can be made to be razor sharp. And then they also have daggers, knives made out of wood and obsidian as well. So their <clears throat> their um, weaponry is much more advanced than anything else at the time. Toltecs were very big into trade. They traded with groups in North America. They traded with groups south of them. Uh, they did know the Mayans and traded with the Mayans. Um, they traded obsidian, uh, cacao, and vanilla. Eventually, the Toltecs are going to be replaced by the Mayans, and uh, they do coexist for a little while. 
Uh, the Mayans are found along the Yucatan Peninsula in the southern part of Mexico and into the countries of Belize. And they're going to rapidly expand from about 650 to 900. That's going to be like the high point of the Mayan culture. Um, the Mayan culture, it's a set of somewhat independent kingdoms. They are the balance to the Toltecs, if you will. Uh, some of these kingdoms have 50 to 60,000 inhabitants, which is a huge number for the day. Um, it's estimated that some of the populations, there were 1,000 people per square mile, which uh, for the time period was unheard of and actually it was um, unsustainable. These torrential downpours are going to wash away the topsoil from these huge cities. It's going to result in lower food availability and malnutrition. And it's going to end really with the ruling classes suffering and people basically killing each other, survival of the fittest, to make sure that they have, have food. Some of the kingdoms, though, specifically uh, Chichen Itza, that was in the north, it was a little bit smaller, so it got to, uh, to survive a little bit longer. Uh, Chichen Itza is going to uh, really last up until the early thousands. And it's probably the most famous of these Mayan civilizations, these Mayan kingdoms, if you will. The Mayans, just like the Toltecs, they traded. Uh, the, they traded with the Toltecs, they traded with other Mayans, and the Mayans even traded with uh, people in the Mississippi River Valley as well. Um, Toltecs and the Mayans, they use many of the same weapons. Um, they do have a shared and similar cultural background. Both the Toltecs and the Mayans can trace their lineage back to a city called uh, Teotihuan, which um, was in central Mexico. The Tiwanaku and the Wari are two ind indigenous groups that uh, I honestly don't know a whole lot about. Um, they are not as well known as the Mayans or the Toltec or the Inca or anything like that. But what I can tell you about them is they were located in modern-day Peru and modern-day Bolivia. Uh, they were basically the people of South America before the Inca Empire. Um, uh, Tuanaku and Wari were two cities that had cultures that expanded around them. And both of these cities become political centers and cultural centers, and they compete with each other and against each other. They are eventually going to expand to cover the both of the valleys they uh, they live near. Uh, the Tiwanaku they live along the Moquica Valley, I think is how you say it, and the Wari live along the Ayacucho Valley. Both of those are located within the Andes Mountains. Now the Andes, they're going to provide like this perfect place to live. Um, they are somewhat protected. There are streams, there are mountains, there are valleys. That gives them water for fishing, water for sustenance, water for agriculture. And both of these groups are fairly well um, established and they're very successful. They build into the side of these mountains and, and they have terraces where they're able to grow food. Now eventually there is going to be some competition between the two because they start to expand into the same territory and um, they don't really like each other very much. One of the interesting things about these two groups is they come up with the same idea, this idea of reciprocity. 
basically everybody works together and then everybody feasts together. Or in other words, you get to enjoy uh, the benefits of your hard work. Both are going to be ruled by the high class elite. The same climate change that weakened the Mayans is going to weak the, weaken the Tiwanaku and the Wari as well. And eventually they will be replaced by the better known Inca. The Aztecs are probably the best known of the Central American group. And their reign isn't as long as you think. We think of the Aztecs being there for years, but in reality, the Aztecs are going to nominate Mexico for about 200 years. That's all. Uh, the Aztecs, another name for them is Mexica or Me uh, Mexica, if you say it right, uh, which is where we get our name Mexico today. Um, the Aztecs, they are a subset of the Toltecs. Uh, they settle around what is modern day Mexico City. It was based on a prophecy. Uh, according to legend, uh, the Aztecs would know where to settle when they find a, a eagle with a snake in its mouth sitting on a rock. And by God, they travel and they find an eagle with a snake in its mouth sitting on the rock and they say this is my home they are going to grow through conquering their neighbors and because of that they actually have a lot of enemies they're also known for ritualistic sacrifice and you can see there a picture of somebody being uh, chopped in half and if you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, you're going to have a good idea of, of what to expect. They would cut the hearts out of innocent, people they considered innocent. Uh, there was ritualistic cannibalism. They would eat people. And it was considered an honor to have your heart sliced out. Or it was an honor to be cannibalized. Um, a lot of <clears throat> priests or people they considered divine or um, virgin girls, things like that. And it was always, it was a big deal if your family was chosen to be one who was a sacrifice. Eventually, um, not only was it these innocents who were sacrificed, but war prisoners and enemies were sacrificed as well. The Aztecs have a very large army. It was over 25,000 people. They have specific military training schools, and they also used the obsidian weapons, those glass weapons that the Toltecs used. Now, one of the really cool things to me about the Aztecs is this use of a, um, an agriculture device called a chinampa. And I've got a picture there of a chinampa, a, mo a modern mock-up of what one looked like. And these are basically going to be floating rafts that are connected to the floor of ponds and the floor of lakes. And they pile dirt on these rafts and they grow food. So they use these chinampas as fields. They're floating fields to grow all of their food. Now, last but not least, we have the Inca. This is the best known of the South American group. And they begin somewhere along the city of Cusco, which is along the shores of Lake Titicaca. Uh, they're actually going to be uh, the successors to the Wari. The first person recognized as in the uh, leader of the Inca is Pachacuti Yupanqui. And I've got a pi picture of Yupanqui right there. Um, and he's known as the Sapa Inca, meaning the head Inca. And that's in 1438. He takes power 
from his brother and he is going to be the one who greatly expands the territory controlled by the Inca. Before the Inca are done expanding, they're going to extend all the way from Quito and Ecuador all the way down to Santiago in Chile. Basically the entire length of the west coast of South America. Uh, they also speak a language called Quechua and I have known two Quechua speakers in my life. It is still a language used today. So the language of the Inca is still used in places like Ecuador and Bolivia, Peru, and even in Chile. The Inca have this thing called Mita and Mita it was service. If you didn't have enough money to pay your taxes, then you would perform work in the name of the Sapa Inca or the emperor. And that emperor, um, you would owe the emperor something and then you would build a road or build a temple or something like that in exchange for money. Another thing they did is they, uh, they kept records using these ropes called kipi or kipu. I've seen both names, kipi with an I at the end or kipu with a U at the end. And each knot and where the knot was done, it would keep tax records, it would keep track of population, uh, it would show who did or did not perform their service to the emperor. And we have many of these knotted ropes that still exist today. So we have the records of the ancient Inca. Then last but not least, uh, the Inca were known as these great road builders. And the roads belong technically to the emperor. And there are over 25,000 miles of these roads. Many miles of roads are still used today. They were put together so well. Now, the Inca roads, you can only use them if you have permission of the emperor. If you were caught using the road without the permission of the emperor, it was a death sentence. And there was also the, the messaging system for the Inca as well. There were guard stations every so many miles so that a messenger could run full speed from one guard station to another to make sure that word spread throughout the empire as quickly as possible. Now there is more that we're going to mention about these groups, but it's going to be in a couple of lectures. This is just your first introduction lecture to kind of ease you into the semester. Uh, remember before the 23rd at 1159 p.m. You need to do your first discussion, your introduction discussion, and your chapter 15 quiz. Also, to get us started on the right foot, if you send me a message either in Blackboard or to my email between now and the 23rd saying, Mr. Kennedy, I watched your video, I will give you an extra five points on your first quiz. So already right there, we have a real quick way to boost your grade. All right, that's all. Thank you for joining my class. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let me know if there's anything I can do better for you. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.